You can do that. Community. You could. Yeah, well, we are we are actually now uh, uh, streaming to our, our audience as people filter in. Um, so here in a few minutes, I'll start doing a more a more formal introduction. Um, of course, one of the downsides of the webinar is that we cannot see the people who are here attending, um, but they're there. Um, and uh, so far, this is the fifth. I'm, I'm just kind of giving a couple of you background because I know you're new to this uh, to this equation. Uh, we've we've had uh, a lot of good response to uh, to this programming. Uh, so this will be our fifth. So uh, so far, I think it's it's proved worthwhile in, in spite of not being very happy about the circumstances that forced mm -hmm. us uh, into uh, giving this a try. Since I don't think we would be doing this if it hadn't been for the, uh, the pandemic. Well, I, I love that you've been able to do this. I think this is brilliant. I, of course, I'd rather be in person. Mm -hmm. I know that I, I mean, I was teaching in person today and the difference, of course, is, a, you know, it's about the energy, it's about the excitement, it's about being able to interact in person. That's so much fun. But this, I think, has just been wonderful in sort of being able to make accessible, you know, even to people who may not be able to make it every single time. This right. is just, I feel like there's a lifeline for me to be able to reconnect. And, and it's, it's really wonderful. Well, and, and I, I've been pleased with the way it's allowed for a, a, a degree of dialogue between uh, the Tor House community and the Jeffers Association community, because those are very complementary and somewhat overlapping groups, mm -hmm. um, but they also are somewhat distinct groups. And mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a little more of a sense of shared project maybe coming about because of this. So I think we're, we're on now officially, okay. So uh, to all of those out there who I cannot see, welcome to the uh, fifth uh, webinar sponsored by the Jeffers Association and the Tor House Foundation. Uh, this one is titled New Voices and New Directions in a Jeffers uh, Scholarship. I wanna start by uh, noting something that many of you are already aware of, and that is that we recently uh, lost uh, Bob Brophy uh, at the age of 93, after a long and very distinguished career in many ways. Um, Bob, of course, uh, has been for a whole generation or more the Dean of, of Jeffers Scholarship. Um, many of us um, who are in part of the conversation got our start working with Jeffers under Bob's direction. Uh, I know he published the very first piece I ever wrote, and I remember the extent to which he went out of his way to uh, not only make me welcome, uh, but to find occasions for me to connect with the, uh, the broader uh, group of people who were working on, on Jeffers, um, which at that time would be people like uh, Bill Everson and, and Frederick Ives Carpenter. Um, part of what I think becomes then important about that as we think about this evening uh, is that Bob said, an expectation that a scholarly community is in fact a community. Uh, so it's a dialogue and it is a supportive group, uh, not to say that everyone has to agree, um, but that we're all trying to work forward uh, together. And Bob did that uh, in, her, in his personal dealings with many of us. He did that as the longtime editor of the Jeffers newsletter, uh, the initial editor of Jeffers studies, uh, and that's even without acknowledging the importance of myth, ritual, and symbol uh, as a paradigmatic uh, monument in Jeffers scholarship. So uh, I want to take this. E I want to take a moment this evening to acknowledge, and also I think to suggest that Bob would be happy with the occasion of this particular webinar, because in fact what we are doing um, is welcoming. Uh, several new voices and projects uh, into the mix. So uh, tonight we're trying to carry forward uh, Bob's example. Uh, so for all of those who knew Bob, uh, a great man, 
uh, a great member of the Jeffers community. For all of you who didn't know him, you are with us in his debt. Um, so tonight we are looking at three different modes and occasions uh, for exploring the work of Jeffers. And I think that that's part of what allows us to understand the extent to which Jeffers is a great poet. It's not only that he continues to uh, initiate conversation of a, num of, of, a, of a very rich sort, but he continues to initiate renewed and new avenues of discussion and exploration. And so that's why I think it's uh, so exciting tonight to be able to have three uh, new voices and new projects. And, and Geneva, I know you're not a, a you're, you're, you're a little more of, a, of a, an experienced hand and part of the community than that, but you do have a brand new book, uh, which is of course what we are also celebrating. So tonight we have, we'll go alphabetically. I'm not going to go into an elaborate uh, introduction because you already have that in your written notes, uh, but we'll start with Catherine Bubel, uh, then Brett Colosaco, uh, Colosico, and finally Geneva Gaino. Um, they will each speak informally for uh, 12 to 15 minutes, kind of giving you an overview or introduction to their work. Uh, and then we'll move into the question and answer. Uh, and I will first invite them uh, to pitch questions to each other. Uh, and then I will be trying to do my best to feed into the mix questions that you bring forward by posting them in the chat box uh, for um, uh, Zoom, which is of course the same thing that we've used before. And before we move to the first presentation, uh, just a couple of quick thank yous. I want to acknowledge uh, Jim Carmen and Elliot Ruckowitz Roberts, uh, the presidents of the Jeffers Association and Torhouse Foundation for uh, enabling these programs and sponsoring them. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Jessica Hunt, who is our producer and stage manager, who is basically making all of this happen off screen, even though you cannot see her. So, um, there we go. Uh, so Catherine, will you give us a start? Thank you so much for that uh, welcome. And it's really a delight to be with you this evening to present with my fellow panelists, Geneva and Brett. And I echo those gra that gratitude to, um, to all the people behind the scenes, Tim and Jessica included, and uh, just the association and the Tor House Foundation for your joint hospitality. Thank you. Um, as I begin to show my slides, and uh, being the first to go, I, I trust that there will be no glitch. I uh, just want to give a shout out to the Tor House Dawson, whose name escapes my memory. Um, this person in October 2013 graciously waited as my spouse and I rushed down from Berkeley, where I'd given a conference paper, and we were the last guests of the day squeezed in. So glad for that time because we were enthralled by all that we saw and heard on the tour. And this is me perched on the edge of those rocks that so many of you will know at the foot of the slope in front of Jeffers home. I gazing at the boundaries of granite and spray, the established sea marks felt behind me mountain and plain, the immense breadth of the continent before me the mass and double stretch of water. Will the effects of being on that Jeffers continent end edge linger? And with the mention of those effects and that edge, I'll pivot to um, say that what I have found compelling for my research um, has been uh, looking at what you will find in my title of my uh, recently completed uh, work, Edge Effects, Poetry, Place, and Spiritual Practices, um, a dissertation completed a few years ago. And the frame of my dissertation on, and ongoing research puts Jeffers in the company of other poets of the 20th and 21st century who have lived on the Pacific coast, including Theodore Retke, Robert Haas, Denise Levertov, and a Canadian philosopher poet, Jan Zwicky. 
So I'll start with the term edge effects. It was coined by ecologist Aldo Leopold to describe the interactions between various species in the transitional edge or the ecotone in which two environmental zones overlap and blend. At these dynamic meeting places better conceived as fields of interpenetrating forces and forms, better than thinking of them as sharply defined borders, there is an abundance of biodiversity due to exchange and adaptation. So I use this trope of the edge to imagine the cultural, social, and geographical place from which the poets attend to the interrelations of things in the more than human community, what Jeffers called the transhuman, with quite different intention than those folks in Silicon Valley, referring to that which doesn't enhance or amplify the human, but rather transcends the human, um, referring to the divine or the sacred whole. And I continue to be intrigued by writing that is particularly lyric and meditative poetry emerging from that porous zone where environmental and religious imaginations interpenetrate. So in terms of place, to tell you where I'm coming from, my project attends to works of dwelling in the bioregion on the western edge of our continent in which I too live. If you were to follow what Jeffers imagines in that early lyric, A Partial Secret, as the sneaky filament of light, the glowing surf forming a line of undulating beauty up the coast from Tor House, you'd find my place in southern British Columbia on the shores of Boundary Bay in the Salish Sea, just south of Vancouver. The name of my place of dwelling, Sawasan, is that of the First Nation here. It's the Sawasan is the Helmicamelan Coast Salish word translated facing seaward. And I've had the privilege of doing that for over 20 years in my regular walks on our Boundary Bay Dyke. I have been strengthened by these poets' example to locate an axis mundi of my being in the world in this place. Indeed, I love what Robert Frost, once a Californian himself, said in an interview with the Los Angeles Times in 1958, I am an admirer of Robinson Jeffers. He has kept California as a base. He hasn't run out to New York. So the trope of the edge helps me trace geographic relations between my selected poets in which each in their particular place has been part of a part of the greater whole. And that's quoting Gary Snyder, who points out that a bioregion that is shared in common of all, with all these poets is biota, water, biota watersheds, landforms, and elevations. Those are all facets of the bioregion. And one can form the concept of a bioregion of what he calls the Pacific Slope in one, one um, facet by looking at the coastal Douglas fir, which, which grows native from central British Columbia to central California. Snyder asserts that the literary mapping of the far west or of the Pacific Slope is not all that old. So speaking of the literary mapping, one could say that it pretty much begins says Snyder with Robinson Jeffers, who is an inspiration and to some small extent an irritant to us all. So the stance of these poets is counter to Milton Satan, a possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. Instead, places of dwelling are axes of attention to the world and the poems are indexes to the proposed worlds they open up. So I investigate the way that, to use Robert Hass's vivid expression, the poet's language came to the landscapes of the coast and took hold, but also how the coast took hold of and shaped the language of these texts. In this way, the poems convey possible ways of being in the mutual construction of discourse and material world. I pay attention to what Snyder in the practice of the wild calls very loosely the spirit of the place, and of the sacred, which he defines as that which helps take us out of our little selves. Here we can recall Je Jeffers' invitation and signpost to self-transcend our little ecocentricisms by turning outward to the stones and the stars to see God. Abraham Heschel defines the sacred as saying yes to a no. It is an acknowledging of human limits. 
So um, our friend Gary takes us to thinking about poetry as spiritual focal practice as a place. And that it gets to the heart of the spiritual practices indicated, indicated in my title. I see the poetry as engaging practices and aesthetics of relinquishment and affirmation, of letting go and of embracing, of detachment and affection, no's and yeses in a person's relation with what is. Poetry, particularly meditative lyric, is viewed in my project as a discursive spiritual exercise accompanying other practices of place, notably meditative walking and working, attentive looking and listening. The philosopher historian Pierre Hadot has shown that for the ancient Greeks, Romans, and early Christian theologians, especially in the monastic tradition, to pursue philosophy was to be a practitioner of a way of lived and experienced wisdom. It was to belong to a way which involved practicing psycho psychagogy or soul calling, spiritual exercises and discourses that engage not thought only, but the entire psychism aimed to effect a transformation of their vision of the world and to a metamorphosis of their personhood. Philosophy seen in this way is essentially an effort to become aware of ourselves, our being in the world, to relearn how to see the world. So I add to Hadot's idea of spiritual practices, Albert Borgman, a philosopher of technology's concepts of focal practices, and this brings us more in an ecological direction. Albert Borgman um, defined focal things and practices as, um, as spiritual practices that focus us, but he, he pays attention as Jeffers does in his lo late poem, The Unformed Volcanic Earth, to the etymology, the root of focus. The concentration, Jeffers thinks of it as uh, of consciousness as a burning glass or blazing hearth. Borgman notes that the Latin word focus means hearth, constituted um, in the Latin world, a center of warmth, of light, and of daily practices. For the Romans, the focus was wholly the place where the household gods resided. And so the hearth sustained, ordered, and centered house and family. So this idea of these spiritual practices as focusing on something, something that he calls the focal thing, brings it into focus. And that makes that focal thing central, clear, and articulate. Borgman adds the idea of um, the idea of dialectic discourse, which is a kind of discourse that's about that which constitutes a center by which we can orient ourselves. It's a testimony of these tangible bodily things and practices, these focal things that orient the poet's work. And so that's um, for Jeffers what, what brought my attention to um, his work was his own focal thing, um, a kind of dialectic or di uh, a dipolar starfire and rock strength. And that phrase is from the Inhumanist. And it matches a line in a later lyric from Salvage, the beautiful secret in places and stars and stones. We know stones he worked with as Mason by day and the starry sky he watched by night from his Carmel shore. These focalizing things and practices clearly have effects on him. And how I picture those effects, uh, just to, to quickly wrap up, is um, we see in his late um, project, which I pick up a I pick up what Tim Hunt has done um, in his scholarship, but also what Stephen Chapman and Robert Zoller uh, were attending to the, the the long poem project to see his late poems as, as a, a whole project, which he referred to in his notes as the De Natura, and enjoined it in that way to uh, ancient wisdom tradition. I look at his themes of one, his pantheistic religious feeling and beliefs about the universe, two, his contemplation of the beauty of the universe as perceived from his rocky coast, and three, his contemplation of death. And in this, I see uh, a spiritual practice of um, the icon, the dipolar image of starfire and rock strength as, um, 
the sense all you can see here that he he played with the way that the tides were mirroring the fire of the stars and the coming to be of all that we know of as our cosmos and contemplating the beauty was a kind of eco-spiritual eros it was the heat and the passion of the focus um and so you can see in this late poem the unformed volcanic earth a female thing that was furiously following with erotic um fury she follows the sun and um he imagines this cosmic view of how all things came to be contemplates the beauty that is reflected in each individual thing um, that is focused in his mind and it is met by the contemplation of death and in that he's practicing the cool of ataraxia the ancient um, idea of peace of serenity of balance and so we see this in his poems, The Old Stone Mason, um, where he refers to the old granite stones. Those are my peeps, <laughs> hard heads and stiff wits, but faithful, not fools, not chatterers. And the place where they stand today, they will stand also tomorrow. And then in Pleasures, another late lyric, there is a higher pleasure to lie among the cold stones, my older brothers, to lie quietly and barnacled under the film of surf and look at the sky. And so there is um, in this uh, dipolar icon of place, starfire and rock strength, what I think of as a focal spiritual practice. And um, that has compelled me uh, that that has environmental significance uh, that has inspired me. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, Brett, before we let you start, I, I guess I need to remind people that if they have questions they want to pose, to do it in the Q&A box. Um, so thank you, Catherine. Brett, do you want to jump in here? Sure thing. Um, yeah, thank you, Catherine. That was great. Um, I, I don't have any slides, but uh, as I was thinking about what you know, I might say tonight, I figured the easiest way into the research that I did for my dissertation might be to tell you a bit about how I first discovered Jeffers um, and what drew me to his work um, as a kind of focal point for my doctoral research. Um, that's a question I think in one form or another, we've probably all been asked uh, more than once, you know, how did you first discover Jeffers? Uh, since he's, he's not a writer that, uh, that, that most people know about, and in my experience, he's not even a writer that most scholars of 20th century American poetry are familiar with. Uh, but I, I came to Jeffers not from a background uh, primarily in literature, but, but uh, more from a background in the academic study of religion. Um, so I did my, my graduate work within the, the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Um, and kind of early in my studies was sort of restless and, and moved around from field to field a little bit. Uh, there were times where I was planning to specialize in, in early Christian studies and then in the history of biblical interpretation um, and then in modern American religion and before finally uh, settling on an area that was at the time called religion and literature, uh, which seemed to be you know, multidisciplinary and, and uh, capacious enough uh, to give me the chance to, to kind of roam and let my mind uh, uh, run free a little bit while still formulating what I hope uh, was ultimately a uh, coherent thesis. Um, but throughout all of this, what, what really captivated and motivated me most consistently uh, were questions of theory and method within the field of religion more broadly. Um, and in particular questions about myth as a category. So how you know, modern and contemporary uh, scholars understood and, and utilized this category to interpret traditional beliefs and practices um, and how thinkers and cultural figures, especially during the first half of the 20th century, um, reclaimed it as a tool for describing what it was that they were trying to achieve through their thought or art. Um, and then finally, the relationship between myth and ideology. So whether there's something inherently political um, and specifically uh, something inherently right-wing or even fascistic about modern day attempts to reclaim and revalorize myth. So a really critical figure for me in this regard 
um, well before I, I first encountered Jeffers was uh, Mircea Eliade, um, who is one of the most influential scholars of religion of the past century and someone whose legacy still looms large at the University of Chicago. He taught there from the, the 1950s through the 1980s. Um, and Eliade's most important books, um, in particular his works, uh, Patterns and Comparative Religion and The Myth of the Eternal Return, both from 1949. Um, these were extraordinary sweeping comparative studies of data drawn from seemingly every religious tradition that never existed. Uh, and he interpreted it all through these incredibly powerful frameworks, which he presented as being universal. Um, so for Eliade, religious phenomena could all be explained in terms of what he called hierophanies, or these eruptions of the sacred into the realm of the profane. Um, and these hierophanies spawned parallel symbol systems across different cultures. Uh, the sky representing an Apio's high god, the sun as a symbol of political power, the moon, water, vegetation, all of these things had their specific uh, universal transcultural meanings. And myth for Eliade was the lens through which uh, the archaic ontology of traditional religious people uh, made sense of time. So all myths for him were origin myths, um, stories of what the gods did in the beginning and the things that people did, whether it be what we would think of as an obviously religious ritual practice of worship uh, or something as apparently mundane as building a canoe, uh, these things only had meaning for traditional peoples that were only in a, in a, in a, in a very important sense real uh, insofar as they participated in and repeated uh, some creation myth. So almost no one in the field of religious studies today follows Eliade's approach to studying religions or finds his system to be a reliable guide uh, to cross-cultural religious data. But because he had, he had an agenda that was constructive uh, and not merely analytical or, or descriptive, um, so this has raised a lot of suspicion uh, about his work among, among uh, his successors within the field. Um, you know, part of Eliade's vantage point was that he saw this archaic ontology and, and myth in particular uh, as something of an antidote um, to what he took to be the, the chaos and the profaneness of modern life. Uh, so modernity for him had irreparably fallen into what he called the terror of history. Um, but at the same time, he noticed uh, that there were efforts within modern culture and literature in particular um, to reclaim myth as a tool for organizing um, this chaos and the fragmentary nature of modern life into something that you know, he felt could have its own kind of order and a form that could resonate um, with the more cohesive ontology as he understood it of the past. So in The Myth of the Eternal Return, one of his two more you know, most famous books, uh, Eliade specifically cites T.S. Eliot and James Joyce uh, as figures who exemplified this trend. Uh, he doesn't analyze their work in any detail, uh, but anyone who's familiar with Eliot's uh, famous review of Joyce's Ulysses, it's titled Ulysses, Order, and Myth, um, will we'll understand why you know, these, these writers probably stood out to Eliot in this regard. But myth, or something like it, um, as a literary category for reacting to and against modernity, uh, certainly isn't unique to these two writers and it resonated with and it's been applied to many of the leading poets of the modernist generation. Um, you know, in addition to Eliot figures like Ezra Pound, um, William Butler Yeats and D.H. Lawrence. And it's of course a category that has been central uh, to the interpretation of Jeffers and his poetry, uh, most notably uh, by the late Bob Brophy in his really you know, seminal uh, 1973 work, um, Myth, Ritual and Symbol. Um, and Eliade, it's, it's worth uh, noting here, is one of the theorists that, that Brophy relies upon quite a bit uh, in making his argument that Jeffers' narratives have myth ritual structures as their underlying and driving um, basis. So um, this is really the context in which I first encountered Jeffers' name and his, and his work um, as a, you know, a poet contemporaneous with the great modernists who liked them made myth a central component of his uh, poetic vision. And these were the, the, the interests that I brought to my study of Jeffers writings. But uh, there was another question that, that very quickly emerged and proves uh, inescapable, 
um, and, and, and came in a way to kind of dominate my thinking on this topic. And that's the relationship between myth or mythical thinking and radical right-wing politics, in particular fascism. Uh, so one of the things that many of you will know unites Jeffers with, with people like Elliot Pound, Yates, and Lawrence is that they were all accused at one time or another of being fascists. Um, but un unlike them, the case for Jeffers being a fascist or a you know, quasi-fascist fellow traveler um, is, is pretty hard to make. Uh, Pound actively supported Mussolini's government and Yates didn't hide his own admiration for Italian fascism either. Um, Eliot had deep intellectual roots in French proto-fascism like the Action Francaise. Um, and by all accounts, he developed a you know, quite conservative and, 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 and even authoritarian viewpoint in, in politics. Uh, Lawrence seems to espouse something like a fascistic political viewpoint at times. Um, and, and, and none of this was true of Jeffers to nearly you know, the same extent, though there were you know, certainly bits of evidence here and there that suggest he may have leaned toward the right ideologically in kind of the old you know, classical sense. Um, it's a complicated thing, however. Um, and of course, he did you know, raise some, I think, unfair suspicions about this by his um, anti-interventionist stance during uh, the Second World War. But um, what really intrigued me was how the case of Jeffers might complicate a more complex argument that underlies a lot of this um, in the, you know, the critical discussion about myth in religion and literary studies, which is that the, you know, the argument that the, the, the modern day fascination among certain thinkers like Eliade or certain writers like Eliade or Gates with myth as an antidote to modernity is intrinsic to their attachments to fascist or quasi-fascist politics. So, you know, Eliade actually had his own problematic uh, political associations in his youth. So his name and his work have become you know, an especially intense flashpoint for this debate within the field. Um, the book Theorizing Myth by Bruce Lincoln is, is maybe the most influential study and resource on this topic um, from the past uh, couple of decades anyway. Um, Lincoln being a former student of Eliade's who in his own mature scholarship decisively turned away from his mentor's approach. Um, and then in literary criticism, I would say, and, and I rely upon this quite a bit in the dissertation, um, Frank Kermode's The Sense of an Ending um, was and, and, and remains still, I think, the classic uh, scholarly text on this, on this topic. Um, so the way that I chose to come at these issues in the, the dissertation was by organizing um, everything around a date, um, which is 1948. And, and really use this as a kind of um, emblem for the immediate post-war period as a whole. Um, because that I think is where these issues really come to a head. Um, you know, this period with the, the memory of fascism and its defeat still really fresh in the West. Um, you have the, the Bollingen Prize being awarded to Pound uh, by a selection committee that included Eliot, um, sparking allegations in the Saturday Review of Literature that the, that the prize was laying the foundations for a resurgent cultural fascism in America. Um, you have uh, really extraordinary scholars during the same period, like Eric Auerbach, laying out a, a, a comprehensive understanding of Western literary history that prizes a certain kind of realism over and against myth, um, you know, with fascist myth-making kind of lurking in the background as sort of the enemy. Um, and, and then you have Jeffers, uh, who had his own strong conception of reality, um, which he talks about all the time, you know, both in his poems and then his, in his prose writings about his poetics. Um, and this conception of reality is one that had myth, you know, as a core component. Um, he'd been adhering to this conception since at least the, the Temar period, um, but it's, it's in 1948, during this period, when he really only gives it its final clear articulation under the name humanism, you know, in the 1948 preface to the double acts. Um, and then, you know, again, during the same period, you also have Eliade's most important work. So it's really an extraordinary uh, period intellectually. But, um, but so stemming, you know, from this approach of organizing things around a date, the, the dissertation, I, I, I structured it in, in five sections. Um, with a, a brief introductory discussion of Jeffers in relation to the pound and the 
uh, the Lynch and Prize episode, um, which is particularly interesting because the Saturday Review actually liked Jeffers' poetry, um, even if they didn't you know, like his views. Um, then there's an account of Jeffers in relation to um, Auerbachian realism, um, which also interprets Jeffers as a kind of American Wagner. Um, Wagner being, in, 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 in my uh, reading of Auerbach, kind of the invisible foil that um, kind of lurks behind the text. Um, and, and Wagner, of course, being kind of the key source for the mythology of, of national socialist uh, fascism. Um, but then the, the central and the longest chapter deals with Jeffers and his fellow modernist poets. So arguing that you know, Jeffers ought to be regarded not as an alternative to modernism, um, as much as he himself kind of at times seems to want to portray his work as that, uh, but, but, but rather as a different kind of modernist, a kind of, you know, an alternative modernist himself. Um, and that, and then through that explaining why I think Jeffers didn't fall into some of the same political traps that the other modernists did, um, Pound and Yates in particular, um, because I, I think and, and, and I argue in this section of the work that you know, Jeffers' conception of myth, what distinguishes it from these others is that it was authentically universalist. So he absorbs humanity into a totalizing vision um, of natural process, to echo some of um, Tim Hunt's uh, writing on this. Uh, you know, whereas the other modernists, you know, for them, myth was always subsumed in, in some form of humanism, whether they would have termed it that or not. Um, and it could only really be used to elevate certain human collectives or cultures over others. Um, moving on from that, the, 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 the penultimate section um, examines Jeffers' characterization of Hitler um, in, his, in his verse drama, The Bowl of Blood, um, a, a rather understudied, uh, but very interesting work within Jeffers' corpus, I think. Um, and this chapter argues that Jeffers uh, actually intuited certain aspects of the nature of fascism better than any of the other modernists, including those who were you know, much more attracted to, um, to it as a political system. Um, and then in conclusion, I, you know, I pull back out to 1948 and look at Jeffers' articulation of inhumanism in comparison to the emerging discourse of human rights around that time, um, with a particular focus on Hannah Arendt. Um, so the, the, the last thing that I, I, I wanted to say kind of before I probably get muted for running long is um, that I've, I've been thinking a lot over the past week about what, you know, the research that I did could be said to like truly add to Jeffers' scholarship, you know, in, like in the wake of someone like Bob Brophy's death. Um, you know, I, I didn't know and I never met him, um, unlike many in this community. Um, but his work certainly had uh, an enormous impact on mine. I don't, I don't think that I, I ever would have been moved to write you know, a dissertation that focused on Jeffers, myth, and politics if there hadn't been the precedent set by, by Brophy's book. Um, and I still really believe that book may be the best and the most useful you know, examination that we have, an introduction to Jeffers, uh, Jeffers' narratives. Where I, where I do think that, you know, my work might make a contribution, however small, uh, is that, you know, where Brophy looked at Jeffers and myth through something of a kind of Eliadian lens, which would, would have been wholly acceptable and uncontroversial at the time, either in literature or in the study of religion. Um, you know, my work tries to look at Jeffers and Eliade and others as really contemporary cultural and intellectual figures you know, whose writings are, are, are in dialogue with one another, if not explicitly, then at least because they're all shaped by the same milieu, um, by the, many of the same factors, so the two world wars, um, the, the sense that modernity was, was in some way a problem to be overcome. Um, and then that, that a return to order through myth might be an answer to that problem. And finally, that the, you know, the, the legacy of fascism as a failed alternative to democracy and still you know, one that, that, that raised questions that we're still um, grappling with in many forms today. So it's this, this sense of Jeffers as a thinker who stands out, um, but doesn't stand entirely apart um, that I wanted to convey. And I, I, I do think that our, you know, our understanding of 
the immediate post-war moment is significantly enriched by including Jeffers in, in whatever pictures we, you know, we, we pray of it. Um, and at the same time, in our understanding of Jeffers' work is enriched uh, when we open Jeffers' studies up and think about him in some of these broader contexts. Um, so that's, that's really all I, I, I wanted to say, um, uh, unless of course there are any, any uh, questions at the end, so thank you. Thanks. Geneva, take, take us somewhere, take us to yet another place. All right. Well, thank you so much. That that's really um, both of you. Your work is so you know thoughtful, um, Catherine and Brett, and so you know uh, uh, deep um, in in a um, in a contemplative kind of way. I feel like my work is is uh, more superficial in and I and I don't really mean that to be demeaning of myself. I just mean um, I'm I take a very sociological approach to um, literary texts and my approach to Jeffers is um, as it as it appears in my in my recently published book is very sociological in many respects and um, one of my interests in um, pursuing that is sort of um, to try to recapture the human um, uh, part of Jeffers um, and and to sort of bring him down to earth, shall we say, um, and to embed him in the human world in which he in fact lived um, and um, and operated and published his work, you know, and became known. And I think um, sometimes, you know, um, we do become so um, so engrossed, really, as readers of Jeffers, and I think um, rightly. Um, by his his profound thought, by his um, by his messages to us, that um, that sometimes we lose sight of him as a neighbor, as a father, as a friend, you know, as as just a regular guy. And so, um, so you know, I do have um, some slides, and um, I will show those to you so that um, I you don't have to look at my face the whole time. Um, and even though we've been doing um, Zoom for a very long time, it's I still find it just a little bit unnerving to sort of have everyone staring at my face. Um, so um, what I'd like to do here is um, I'm going to. Um, start my slideshow. Um, I do have a few slides and I will um, skim through them pretty quickly. Um, I'm, I begin actually much earlier than um, either Brett or Catherine. Um, I'd like to begin um, with what Carmel looked like uh, before Jeffers arrived and then place him there. So um, this is actually a postcard from about 1926. Um, probably some of you will recognize it as a postcard of Hotel Del Monte, um, a very, very Tony establishment. Um, at the time, you probably see down here in the right hand corner of your screen, um, the Roman plunge baths that were very famous at the time. By 1926, um, as you can also see, the hotel had been um, rebuilt after, after a big fire from the ground up in the um, in the uh, mission revival style, um, there were, as you can also see, fancy gardens, and um, and there were also polo grounds, a racetrack, uh, you know, a, a lot of really kind of incredible um, uh, palatial kinds of things. Um, probably many of you know that um, this is in 1926. Within about um, about uh, well less than a generation, within um, ten, I think, twenty years. Um, Salvador Dali is going to be essentially living here and he hosts a huge party that of course Jeffers is um, invited to and photographed at um, in an in absurd costume with his wife. Um, you probably uh, may also know that um, that um, the uh, Hotel Del Monte um, became internationally known as a beautiful place. Um, it was at uh, at Monterey, but this is um, a postcard from Point Joe, actually, some of you familiar with that name, I suppose, um, on 17 Mile Drive, and 17 Mile Drive is the, the, the tour that um, people like Teddy Roosevelt would gallop their horses on, or that you could take a sightseeing tour um, when you visited the beautiful Hotel Del Monte. 
Um, so um, those places were established and well known by the time Jeffers and his wife arrive. Um, probably a little wet, less um, familiar to us might be um, this image. This is a watercolor um, image that appears in my book, but actually it's, it's so much more beautiful seeing it in color here. This is by William Adam, Adam who um, was a, uh, an instructor at the Pacific Grove Chautauqua. Um, this was done in the 1890s, and this is of the Chinese fishing village at Monterey. So not all of Monterey, of course, looked like um, the Hotel Del Monte. Um, and in fact, um, the Chinese um, fishing villages and abalone um, uh, uh, sort of uh, operations that were um, instituted up and down um, the, the Monterey Bay Peninsula um, these were also um, established by the turn of the century, um, before Carmel by the sea was even a twinkle in its in its uh, developers' eyes. Um, these fishing villages existed and had drawn artists, and that's an important thing that um, I believe is is pretty important. So by the 1890s, you've got um, William Adam in um, the you know probably pretty close to um, Monterey and Pacific Grove, which is where the Chautauqua was, um, with other artists going up and down, finding picturesque locations um, to do their work. Um, some of you may also recognize this um, as an image of Carmel, probably somewhat more familiar because it doesn't have any humans in it, right? And not having humans is one of the um, hallmarks of a beautiful, pristine, wild scenery that was advertised at the Hotel Del Monte, was advertised um, as an attraction for artists, and was advertised um, to people like Jeffers, who were artists who wanted a nice, quaint place to live. Um, and, and actually, I thought I would read a couple things that I found in my research um, from that I've also quoted in my book that may be um, of interest in relation to this. Um, so, of course, um, one of the things we see is that um, uh, by 1892, okay, this is quite some time before Jeffers arrives, um, a, local, uh, a local artist and journalist um, named DJ Mackert published a, a piece in um, a San Francisco paper. I'm, let me see what paper it was. It was the San Francisco Morning Call. And his um, article basically said, artists, writers, bohemians. Monterey is over. If you are a true bohemian, you got to go somewhere else. We're being priced out. The developers are coming into our quaint town and they're buying up all the land. We got to go find someone else. He says um, that the sleepy old Spanish capital had become too fashionable. The natural grandeur of Cypress Point, which had been a little visited wilderness, was now a cliche of regional art. This is by 1892. And, um, and that the whole area had been transformed into, quote, a veritable picnic, picnic ground for the whole state. So um, this, was, uh, this was something that he hoped the true bohemian, who he described as a rollicking man with a paint spitting blouse and a hat that had never known a brush, could um, discover another Monterey, perhaps somewhere a little more remote, a little closer to the ocean, not far, really. Um, and of course, we know. And what was the reasoning that he, uh, he determined in 1892? He said, the speculator right, would not thrive on land values where the bohemian could exist. Well, this may sound familiar, right? The artist being priced out of the quaint locale of the picturesque location. Um, by the time that William Merritt Chase is there in 1914, um, Carmel had already um, started to deliberately develop as a little art colony um, where, uh, where it was actually plotted from its very beginnings as an artist colony. Um, and um, by 1901, so this is just a year before uh, the Devendorfs um, started to sell lots um, as the Carmel Development Corporation, 
um, a woman named Harriet Quimby, who went on to become a famous pilot, actually, <laughs> and, um, and a well-known person about town in New York City and various other places, she reported um, that when she visited the region, everywhere scattered along the road from Del Monte to Pacific Grove, in the fields and along the shore, one can see easels. And under the huge umbrellas, sun bonneted and airy gowned figures sit oblivious to all except the particular rock or tree or patch of sky that is trying to evade their brush. Teachers with classes of 10 or 15, some of the pupils being silver crowned matrons, sit under the shade of the cypress, busy and happy, for there is nothing like communing with nature, even though she does refuse to look like some of the watercolors or pastels of the first few lessons. So um, what we have here is a sign that not only are the rollicking bohemian men with, with unbrushed hats um, you know, populating the area, but we also have the art school matrons, right? The, the seaside vacationers taking a, a Sunday enrichment class for their own improvement and for their leisure. Right. Um, by the time that that um, William Merritt Chase teaches a summer school of art in Monterey or in Carmel. Um, Chase actually didn't like Carmel very much and um, decided that the the um, accommodations available to him there were actually not suitable. So he left and, and stayed in the Hotel Del Monte for most of his time there um, while he was teaching the class. Um, he also was kind of coming at it at an interesting time, as you see, just two years before the Jeffers family arrives, um, the, uh, the Jeffers family being um, sort of at the moment, um, just uh, Robin and Una. And um, Chase was there um, uh, at a time when, um, when there was a great hope to make Carmel a um, international destination for artists who want to, um, to see the picturesque. Um, and, and also at the time, so 1915 is the Pan Pacific Exposition in um, San Francisco, there's a sense that modernism is coming. Carmel has already by this time um, become known internationally um, and nationally, I would say, through as a hotbed of soulful culture and vortex erotic erudition. Um, that's one of the things that it becomes, that's uh, one of the, the uh, 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 headlines that were named about it. You've got people such as Jack London and Mary Austin and George Sterling um, carving, carving names for themselves and sort of making um, this Carmel area notorious for its parties, for its drug and alcohol use, for its paganism, for its nudism, right? All of the fun things that we can imagine about Carmel um, were very solidly established by the time Jeffers decided to move here, which doesn't quite fit with our usual picture of the common serious minded Jeffers. And um, part of my work has been trying to figure out what, what that was about. Um, and so um, what, I, what I did was I, I looked at, um, at, a, at an early guidebook, Carmel at Work and Play. That was a, a really important book for me. Um, that was published actually by a local journalist and a real estate agent actually in Carmel that celebrated the artists and specifically the leisure that was available in Carmel, really positioning it as a place for, for leisure that, that was an escape from the modern world. Some of this is gonna sound a little familiar, right? That, that perhaps in Carmel, one could be secluded from um, from not just the struggles of modernity, which of course um, uh, Jack London writes about in, in Valley of the Moon, right? But also um, um, an escape from, um, from the World War, an escape from, um, from, from all kinds of things, let's say. Um, so Jeffers uh, walks into this and he has become a serious man at this point, right? It's true, probably all of you know, he had a bout of bohemianism himself as a younger man, but that was a SoCal thing. Here on the Central Coast, he found a much more spiritual side. He found a, an ethic of work. And the work ethic is actually the thing that I really 
focus on, and maybe Catherine, I'll ask you a little more questions a little bit later on about method, right? Method and practice, because that interests me greatly. Um, what was what was what what was the work that Jeffers was going to accomplish, and how did it position itself against the play of Carmel? And I think it was decisive. I think that one of the great reasons that Jeffers turned to his serious persona, to his very um, deep, uh, deeply committed dedication, right? To, to hard work, right? And not just that, but to the working people. And here I'm thinking the ranchers, the fishermen, the people he writes about, right? He doesn't write about, well, he tries not to write about the artists too much. He, he really celebrates the working person in the way that I think Frost would in, in lots of ways. His, his view is that he's gonna write their stories. Ideally, right, he would be one of them, that would be great, but he's not that guy. Um, so, um, so part of what I do in my work is I think of him as positioning himself as a working man, right? A, a man in shirt sleeves, a man with no tie, right? This is, he's, he's really reformed from being a dandy, if, if we want to call him that, and a, and a frivolous bohemian, a merry little grasshopper, right? He has become serious. And he is, I think, visually, um, publicly, poetically, trying to signal his seriousness in a way that defines him against the others in Carmel, right? Um, he's, he'd like to step away from, um, from some of the image of Carmel as this kind of place of, of great leisure. And so this is where you get poems like To the Stonecutters, right? And many of us are, 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 are really um, cognizant of this as, as Tim Hunt has actually shown and demonstrated to us, this was a something of a turning point poem at a very important moment. One of the early poems in which Jeffers is actually breaking away from rhymed verse. He's still very interested in telling the stories of people, but at the same time, he's starting to realize, I believe, that he needs to start to um, define his, his material, right? He's defining his material and he's defining his method. Many people have talked about this poem as a poem of method. Um, and, and I think that that is true, um, but it's also, a poem that explicitly assigns, uh, aligns itself with a working man, right? And, and in my, and I don't deal with this in, in my book, but I do talk a little bit about Point Joe as a pretty important poem in this as well. A little bit later um, than, um, than To the Stone Cutters, but part of that uh, really important, you know, first breakthrough novel or breakthrough volume of poetry, right? That comes out in 1924. So this is part of that. Um, and Point Joe, I think, is really a fascinating poem that shows us, you know, the, the, um, the scenery, right? Shows us the scenery of Carmel, like what we saw in that postcard. Beautiful Point Joe, a place where the tourists go and wander, a spot on the 17 mile drive. We can write a postcard home to this place. We can look at how golden it is, how the flowerettes go. You know, we get a lot of flowery poetic language. We see a we see a poet who is searching for his material, right? And then uh, in the second half of the poem, we actually see someone coming back. It's that old Chinaman. It's the Chinaman that William Aiden, Adam, had actually shown us in the watercolor from the 1890s, right? Who had actually been pushed out of Point Joe by that point, right? The working people in Point Joe who got their livelihoods had made way for the tourists of 17 Mile Drive and for the artists, right? The artist tourists. Um, Jeffers was determined, I think, not to become an artist tourist and instead was really deliberately trying to see himself as an artist worker. Something that, um, that would end up being um, a site of struggle by 1930, by the early 1930s, right, in Carmel. 
as individuals associated with the Communist Party and the John Reed Club start to come to Carmel, start to raise rabble, raise, raise uh, some problems for a town that really wanted to situate itself outside, perhaps, of history, outside of modern struggle. Um, this is a moment where um, uh, Jefferson doesn't take the tack they do, but he does, I think, really align himself with the worker um, and thinks of himself as a poet maker in, a, in an old way, um, in a way that is for the people. And it is, um, and, and it is really, I, I guess we could link it back to some of the other conversations by, by saying a poet of democracy in the very old sense. Um, and I'm gonna stop my share right there. Thank you. Well, this has been uh, fascinating. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I know, of course, Brett's work, uh, because I'll, I'll fess up, I was uh, an outside reader on his dissertation, and, and I know Geneva's book, uh, because of course it's now published, and, and uh, also uh, you let me read a little bit of it while you were working on it, which was a lot of fun. Uh, Catherine, your work is much newer to me. The thing that I, I find in common with the very, with the three very different approaches that you're taking is that none of you are particularly focused on what do we summarize out of Jeffers thematically? What do we reduce Jeffers to in terms of this statement or that statement? But you're placing Jeffers uh, in various processes. And I think the processes are complementary. That's why we see um, that, that although the approaches are very different that you, you've each outlined, uh, it's not that we're being forced to choose between them. Um, it's not that they're in contention with each other. So we have Jeffers as spiritual praxis uh, within a particular landscape. We have Jeffers as a man um, thoughtfully uh, engaging his cultural moment through all the tools that he can, can bring to hand and trying to make sense of things. So there's that sense again of exploration, uh, say Brett in, in your chapter on Bowl of Blood, um, uh, which I again, keep encouraging you to get published. Um, and then uh, Geneva, of course, very much the praxis of, uh, of the working man. I thought it was also interesting that, that Robert Frost pops up here a couple of times. I think sometime we need to get some Frost people on a panel with us and our title will be North of Boston, of course, which is Frost's great book uh, dealing with that working, the working people of that region and south of Carmel, because of course the other side of Carmel is Big Sur because that's where the ranchers are. Um, and that would be an interesting thing to, to play with. In other words, how much does Jeffers construct himself not as simply as the poet of Carmel, but as the poet of Big Sur in which he's making a differentiation between those two regions. I think that's implicit in, in a lot of your sense of, of the working, uh, Jeffers as working poet or, or as, as poet of worker. Uh, anyway, the problem here uh, is that uh, we set these things to have an hour uh, shelf life. Uh, we've reached our hour. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, for your time and to our audience who we cannot uh, see, who I'm sure are giving you all a standing ovation. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pretend we hear them clapping. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for taking time to share your work with us. And those of you out there, thank you for taking time this evening to be with us. So uh, that's it for tonight, folks. We'll be back in about three months with another webinar. So are we out, Jesse? <laughs>